22. And if you would look at this with me, Ephesians 4, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the things which is good that he may uh, give, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may be, uh, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away uh, from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in church tonight. What a blessing it is. Lord, with so many folks still gone and out and sick and everything, Lord, you've still brought a, a wonderful crowd here tonight. We are thankful for that. And I pray you'll bless our efforts tonight. May you speak to hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I talked about some things that we must do uh, this morning to, to, in order to walk the talk. There's a lot of folks tonight that today that say they're a Christian, and I hope everybody in here tonight would profess to be a Christian. There's something uh, different about a Christian, that the, uh, one that really is a true Christian, a real believer in Christ, a real bona fide Christian that believes everything from Genesis to Revelation, and you believe that this is the inspired, infallible, uh, inerrant Word of God, and you're a Christian, you're faithful to church, and I praise the Lord for it. But let me say, there ought to be some things Monday through Saturday that... It, that is in your life that comes out on Sunday and that there's some credibility to your Christianity. We talked about credibility this morning and I said credibility or credit comes from the word credo which means I trust or believe. Credibility involves your authority that is affected by your actions, your attitudes, your acclamations and your aims. There's a modern proverb that said, to be persuasive we must be believable. To be believable we must be credible. And to be credible we must be truthful. And so those things were said this morning about our credibility as a Christian. Do you have evidence? Is there credit to your Christianity? Uh, if you go to the bank and, and um, you were to borrow money, the banker would look at you and say, well, we're going to check your credit score to see how much we can loan you or if we can loan you some money because that credit score will reveal some things about your credibility. That's exactly the way it is with our Christianity. We just sung just a while ago about letting our lights shine, uh, send the gospel light, let it shine forevermore. How is our light to shine when we have very little credibility? Why must our light shine? Why must we be credible as a Christian to be an effective witness for Christ? I mean, who would want to witness uh, or hear uh, the salvation plan from somebody that Saturday night they were in a bar and called themselves a Christian and maybe they were in a place of ill repute. Maybe they have some things in their life and you're saying, well, this ain't adding up. You're telling me to get saved and you're telling me that just the other night I seen you out on the ditch drunk as... It wouldn't matter. Folks, listen, we have to be a Christian. Now, there's a difference between being saved and being a Christian. I believe everybody would agree with that. Uh, on your way to heaven, you're saved by the grace of God. Hey, once saved, always saved. Amen. We believe that. And we believe you're sealed until the day of redemption. We, we know that. But, but to be a Christian, you go a step further and say, and I, I'm going to be like Christ. Okay? So there's some things Paul says in order to be like Christ that we ought to do. I'm going to give you those three things. And I gave them the first one to you this morning, so we're going to get through it real quick. But I want to touch on it for those of you who wasn't in here this morning. It's worth your listening. Number one, there's some things we ought to do. Number one, remove. Remove. 
We ought to remove. Look back at verse number 22. That you put off. That means to remove. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. So we ought to put off or remove. Well, you say, preacher, what do we remove? Well, we remove that lifestyle of the lost man. Uh, that lost man. Notice what it says in verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation or the past, the old man. So we ought to lose that old man. That's what you were before you got saved. Some of you remember that old man. You know what? That old man can still rise up in your life. You, know, you must kill it every day. That old man did not get saved. Amen? That old nature still is ungodly and un it's wicked and ungodly and it's, it's, it, it will rise up in you if you don't die to it and kill it and crucify it. Romans chapter 6 and we read that this morning. I think it is verse number 6. Romans 6 verse number 6. The Bible says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So we see we ought to put off that old man. Number two, not only remove the old man, but remove lust. Lust, James 1.14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away uh, of his own lust and enticed. He's drawn away. Uh, he's he's uh, in, in, in his own lust. He's enticed. He's tempted. So remove lust because verse 22 says, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. So there's things that we lust after. This old man, it'll lust after things. Then number three, we should remove livid emotions and words. Livid emotions and words. Look at verse number 31, if you will, please. This is where it's found. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You know what the Word of God says here? Paul's telling this church at Ephesus, get rid of your bitterness. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. The word bitterness, the very word, is the Greek word pecuria, which means to be bitter or hatred or extreme resentful. That means you're extreme. That means bitterness now has taken over and you are resentful and you're hateful and you're bitter. So bitterness has a poisonous effect upon the heart and soul of a person, but it also affects those around you. It's not just affecting you. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. If I were to have a jar up here full of water, setting this jar up here, I thought about it and I forgot tonight to bring a little, but if I brought it up here and had a little jar of water that I was about to drink, and I take some cherry, uh, they got these flavoring things, now you can squirt in this water and make it taste a little better, and a little cherry thing, and I squirt it in there, and of course it turns it red or whatever, and it still would taste good, but then if I took some toilet bowl cleaner, squirted it in there it'd be poison yeah, that's right. be toxic it, it would be very dangerous to your health to take a swig of that though the cherry part would taste very good and you'd say oh preacher it tastes, uh, tastes pretty good for a little bit but the poison would eat your insides out you'd die you'd get really sick you'd be maybe deathly ill, maybe to the point of death. You say, preacher, what happened? Well, it may feel good to vent. It may feel good to get all your frustrations and your bitterness out in the open, but in the end, that poison will take over and it will get you and get those around you. It defiles. What did I do when I squirted the toilet bowl cleaner in the water? I defiled the water. I defiled it. What does bitter do? Bitterness do? It defiles it corrupts. It rottens. So I said this morning, how do I know if I'm bitter? How do I know, preacher, if I'm eat up with this root of bitterness? How do I know that it's in me? Well, I gave you some steps and I want you, if you wasn't in here this morning, look at it. I, I'm going to ask Brother West to put them up on the screen so you can see them, write them down, remember them. How do I know if I'm bitter? This week I was writing some of these down and boy... The Holy Spirit of God was doing a work in my heart and I was thinking, oh no, Lord, I pray that I'm not bitter. Even one ounce of bitterness in me. Number one, how do I know if I'm bitter? Self-pity or a wounded spirit. Self-pity or a wounded spirit. You know what a lot of people do? 
they wallow in their self-pity. They, they literally get down in their self-pity. They get to the very bottom. Hey, I, I, I'm over here. Hey, uh, uh, they have pity on themselves. It's nothing but a big pity party. And they want attention. And they want everything to focus on them. Or it's a wounded spirit. Someone that you ever been around a wounded dog? They'll, they'll, they'll hurt you if you're not careful. They're wounded. Because a person that's wounded is very hurtful. Number two, how do I know if I'm bitter? Statements like, it's not fair. It's not fair. Got news for you. Life ain't fair. It's not. Well, preacher, you don't understand, though. It, it, it didn't happen to so and so, but it happened to me. It just ain't fair. You're right. I ain't going to say it wasn't fair, but I am going to tell you that life ain't fair. Because I could point you in the direction of a lot of people that the same thing happened to them or worse. And they're still going on. Life ain't fair. You're right. That's no reason to get bitter. Number three, no, not thanking God for a difficult situation. You know, I, I was thinking about this the other night. You know, we're easily to, to give God thanks for good situations. I got a raise at my work. I, I got a new car or somebody gave me some money or somebody paid my tab at the... at the. I was uh, got my check and paid it. Uh, I didn't even know it. And I walked to the restaurant to pay and they done pay. What a blessing. Preacher, God's really blessing. But then the difficult times come and you're like, what what you God, what have, what happened? What happened to you? Why has this difficult time come? Hey, what happened to the thankfulness that you had just a few days ago? Thank God for difficult situations. If you're not, there could be some bitterness. How about this? It gets worse. A caustic, critical, negative, sarcastic attitude. Whew. Man, if you find yourself around critical people you know my dad always said this I hope he says it Tuesday night water seeks its level you know it doesn't take long brother Roy doesn't take long for a pastor to come into a church especially a new church and see where everybody migrates who goes to who who's friends with who who goes and talks to who brother Linwood it's natural it's natural you just you have those people you feel comfortable with. Critics seek critics. Bitter people seek out bitter people. Oh yeah. And by the way, can I just remind you it's very evident. It's very evident. And let me warn you that are not don't hang around the critical people. Don't answer their phone calls. Don't go out to eat with them. Don't go to... Unless they're going and saying, I've got to get right some things. Hey, don't you go out there and have a gossip fest and a critical fest and all this and a bitter fest out there and you're just tearing people apart and gossiping and, and being a cynic and being a sarcastic nut and being critical. Hey, before you know it, it'll rub off on everybody and before you know it, you've got a whole bitter slew of people. Guess what you ought to do? You ought to call somebody and say, I just want to give you a praise report. I just want to tell you what God did. I just want to go out and talk about the goodness of God. Hey, but if you're not careful, all you'll do is sit around and waller in your self-pity and you'll be a bunch of wounded spirits out there tearing everybody down. Water seeks its level. It's funny that critics don't call me. Well, I'm awful critical of the church. Let me call the pastor. No, they seek other bitter people because bitter seeks bitterness right you got to have somebody to agree you got to have somebody say yeah you're right yeah you're right yeah that's right i'd tell them i'd tell them but you know what they never do tell you because they waller in their self-pity hey how about this one you're easily offended easily offended the preacher must have been talking about me right I believe he had me in this message the whole time. He had me. I was preaching. Could it not have been? Listen, the Holy Spirit could have been dialing your number. Easily offended. 
I mean, uh, the preacher walked by me or the preacher's wife walked by me or such and such walked by me and didn't speak to me. How dare them? Easily offended. How about holding a grudge? Keeping a list of complaints against some. You ever been in a, somebody been really getting at you and all of a sudden they pull up three years ago? You ever heard that one? Well, two weeks ago, well, three months ago, you did this. And let me just tell you right now, I remember. There's a list. Folks, if any of this is hitting home, folks, this is all things that we can line up in the Bible. Things that you know good and well if you're bitter or not. How about this? Wishing that a person would receive judgment or retribution or calamity. You actually would wish that someone would have something bad happen to them. Boy, that's bad, isn't it? You say, preacher, can it get that bad? It can get that bad. That you actually wish that God would stop blessing somebody and that God would do something to somebody. Folks, that is, that is sad. That's a sad situation. And lastly, uh, preacher, how do I know I'm bitter? Maybe it could be just refusing to forgive our offender. You can go back in your mind tonight and you can think about someone that's offended you or hurt you. Every one of us can. But have you forgave them? Oh, I, I can't forgive them, preacher. That happened to me when I was a child. It happened when I... Have you forgave them? If you refuse, you're bitter. If you refuse to, you're bitter. You're bitter. So keeping bitterness in check. Well, preacher, you've told us, and maybe, maybe you are bitter tonight. I don't know. I have no idea. I cannot look inside your heart. I can't see inside. You can't see inside of me. But maybe one of these or two of these or three of these have fallen into that category. You say, I may be bitter. Preacher, how do I keep this bitterness out of my life? How do I get right with God? Well, I said this morning, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Look at it. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. He said, be ye kind. We need a revival of kindness in the church. Revival of kindness to one another. Be ye kind. And I'll tell you, the good sign of someone that is not bitter is someone that has forgiven somebody. Amen? Because we've been forgiven. Who forgave us? Christ forgave us. God has forgiven us. And uh, we thank God for that. Then look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 19. Wives, you'll like this. I, I, I used this this morning, but the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 19, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So wives, that goes to that goes, we can turn that verse around and say, Wives, be, love your husbands and be not bitter against them. Listen, if you're married in here tonight, love each other. Love each other. You say, well, my, my wife is not in church. You still are commanded to love her. Uh, my husband's not in church. You're still commanded. Could it be of your faithfulness and your love? Go, listen, if you get bitter at them, how's that going to help your situation? So, husbands love your wives, wives love your husbands, and be not bitter against one another. So we see, forgive our offenders and refuse to be bitter. Number one, forgive our offenders and refuse to be bitter. Number two, love the Word of God. Love the Word of God. Psalms 119 verse 11. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, the Word of God, and nothing shall offend them. And then apply the principles of Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28. The Bible clearly teaches in those verses, but I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. So apply those things. How do I keep my bitterness at check. Folks, God, i got news for you. Look up here. You're going to have people hurt you. I mean, it's just, I wish that none of you ever had somebody hurt you, but you're going to. It's going to be how you react to them that's going to determine if you're Christ-like or not. Preacher, you don't understand what they said about me. I may not, but that's between you and the Lord, and I'm telling you right now, you can either hold that grudge and hurt and damage yourself, or go on and say, you know what, I'm still going to love those people anyhow, and I'm going to be a shining light for Jesus Christ. 
So there's some things that we can do. We can love the enemies. We can do good to them that hate you. Uh, we can bless them that curse you. We can pray for them that despitefully use you. Then, the message that I did not get to this morning that I'm going to try to finish tonight. Look at verse number 23, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 23. Notice this. And be, let's all say that word, renewed. Let's say it one more time. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and be renewed so right after verse 22 when he tells us to take off that lust take off that old man he tells us to be renewed so the second thing the first thing was to remove the second thing is to renew renew your mind that word renew uh, in the Greek it says to take on a never mind it or a new mind it uh, is to be spiritually transformed it also is the same thing that means a revival or a spiritual adjustment constantly is needed because we are constantly in battle galatians 5:17 is a great verse that we use uh, for people that are constantly in battle with uh, the flesh and with uh, negative things uh, and we got all those so we're constantly at flesh with our our battle the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit so there's some things that we can renew in our walk with God and renew in our life there's some other things in that verse that uh, in um, I believe it's in uh, let me look right here real quick in verse number 31 there's some other things that we need to get rid of not only get rid of bitterness but get rid of wrath Wrath is from the word thumos, which means a bullying anger or indignation or fierceness, rage, a violent outburst of anger. You realize in America each year, and this is a, 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 a current statistic, that an average of 14 men and women are killed by something we almost see every day and walk by, right, right by it. Many of us have touched this dangerous thing that I'm about to describe to you. You say, what could it be? The answer is a soft drink or a coffee vending machine. Fourteen people die every year. That's right. After not receiving the drink that they punched, they start shaking the machine. These men shook the machine in range until it tipped over and crushed them to death. Each man became a victim of their own temper. You say that is crazy. It's, that's, a, that's a worldly statistic. Fourteen men die every year by vending machine accidents that they lost their temper on. You know what that's called? Wrath. Someone is eat up, not with just bitterness. I know we laugh at that. Some of us cannot imagine. I can't imagine shaking a vending machine and <laughs> and, it fall, and the last thing out of your mind. And uh, you know, y'all understand? Can you imagine that thing tipping over on you and you're smashed with Lay's potato chips in your face and that's how you die? Dear time. You know what though, James 1.19 verse number 20, uh, James 1.19 uh, and verse number 20 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Wrath. People are enraged and they're mad and they're violent and they're angry. Then it says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I've got a temper. You done told on yourself. That don't... Well, preacher, I just lose it and I scream at people and I just lose my cool and I've got a temper. But that's not of God. It's not of God. I don't care how tough and how macho and how cool you think that is. That is not of God. The Bible says uh, that in Proverbs 15, 1, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. God, how does God think about wrath? What's God think about your temper? I'll tell you what He thinks in Proverbs 22, 24, Make no friendship with an angry man. Make no friendship with an angry man. Got a temper problem? 
and the Bible says and goes on to say in that verse and with a furious man thou shalt not go so don't even hang around them if they've got a bad temper you don't know what they'll do to you if they shake a vending machine they may shake you if you don't give them a bag of chips or, or a coca cola amen the Bible says remove all thoughts and desires to take revenge. In, in Romans chapter 12 verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So who's going to get a hold of those people? God will. I've got a friend right now, my jaw just popped. I've got a friend right now uh, that, uh, listen, I've got a friend right now that served time in the penitentiary for, uh, for and he's, I mean, he was a friend that got cut off in traffic and guy cut him off and they and the guy gave him a, a gesture that wasn't good at all so the guy chased him down in traffic flags the guy over gets out of the car and shoots the guy by the way this man's old enough to be my father shot the man just got out listen just about killed the guy didn't kill him just about killed and served time in the penitentiary shot him out of road rage, you say, why, why did that happen? Right here. By the way, a man that's saved had an anger problem. An anger problem. Anger is like filling up a balloon with air and then wrath pops the balloon. Anger builds up in someone and all of a sudden wrath comes in and says, let's just go ahead and explode. And that's exactly what happens in Proverbs 29, 22 says, An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. You know, it's one thing, I've always thought about this, but it's one thing for a man, you know, I've heard ladies before say, Preacher, my husband has a bad temper. It's one thing to scream at some woman and think you're macho. Scream at her and holler at her and command slam doors and threaten her. It's funny when another man walks in the room how they cower down. A bunch of cowards. Wrath. Wrath. Then the fourth thing, look at it, verse number 31. I about skipped over this on my notes and I'm like, man, I can't do that. Let all bitterness and all wrath and all anger. And then how about the word clamor? Clamor. Clamor is the word crage, in, in, in it, which means shouting or screaming. It is the kind of behavior that takes place when someone is angry and arguing, but they, almost, they go past that point of being angry to the point to where now they're shouting and screaming. I used to think clamor. Clamor actually sounds like a pretty happy word. Clamor. You know, it doesn't sound real like wrath and anger. But clamor is kind of like... You know, but clamor may be the worst out of all of them. That means you've lost control. Screaming. Fighting. Hollering. Let me ask you this. If we went down to your neighbor's house and said, hey, uh, those folks beside you, are they Christians? Well, I'll tell you, yeah, they, they, they go to church on Sunday, but I'll tell you, boy, they've had some barn burners, buddy. <laughs> I mean, tell you right now, screaming and hollering and the cops being called and dishes breaking and clamor. You know what, you know what, honestly, and we've, we've added some humor to that, but there's nothing really funny about it. There's nothing funny about someone losing control. Listen to me, listen. Losing control. Get control of your emotions. Get control of yourself. The Bible says remove it all. Get out of it. And then lastly, uh, get rid of evil speaking. Look at it. And put away from you a clamor and evil speaking. So remove these things. Evil speaking. You say, preacher, what's evil speaking? It's the word. It comes from the word blasphemia. The word means to slander or injure another person's good name. To blaspheme or to rail against another person. The railer uh, recognizes no rules, no restrictions, no limitations on his intentions to vilify, defame, or destroy the person. Matter of fact, he could care less about that individual. Railers quibble over meanings of words and stir up arguments. You know what the Bible says about a railer? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 4, He is proud knowing nothing but dotting it about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings. Listen, 
I'm giving you Bible for everything I'm telling you tonight. I know there's not a lot of preaching today on losing your temper and, and, and all these things. I need this. I need this tonight. I need to know uh, the, the diff- anger and wrath. And so we, we hear these words and we think, oh yeah, it's just an angry person. Folks, God hates that stuff. God hates someone that goes around and tears another person's credibility down. Tears a person down. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or, a covetous, or an, an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one, uh, and one not to eat. You know what that's basically saying? Don't sit down with them and have a meal. Don't sit there and have fellowship with them and knowing that that's what... The, that could rub off on you. Folks, we ought to be careful. Then the Bible says lastly in verse 31, get rid of malice. Malice is from the word kekaya, which means to desire to injure someone. Wickedness that is ashamed to break laws, evil, trouble. I hope that's not in here tonight. I hope that none of this is in here tonight. Malice? You say, preacher, someone actually would do evil to somebody? It's out there. Oh, yeah. It's out there. Then I want you to move back to point number two, renew. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 again. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So if you're going to be a consistent, victorious Christian in your walk with God, and it's supposed to match your talk, then you must understand the importance of a renewal in your walk with God and fellowship. That word renewed comes from that word aneo, which is the idea it comes to take on a new mind or to be spiritually transformed, to make new again, to revive or to adjust again. So there's some things that we ought to adjust. Galatians 5.17 For the flesh uh, flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. Romans 7.14 and 15 For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but I what I hate, that I do. So when your mind is renewed daily, it will help you conquer these sins that damage your walk with God and relationships with other people. You say, well, preacher, uh, what do I do when I renew my mind? I'll tell you some things that will happen when you renew your mind. You will go from a temper tantrum to temperance. You'll start getting control. I believe that's one of the things that uh, Reformers Unanimous helps with a lot of people. You say, well, preacher, I've got a temper problem. Then how about going to RU and dealing with that? Because that's really an addiction. You're addicted to being having a temper. And one of the fruit of the spirits, one of the fruits of the spirit, one of is temperance. Control. There's times where you'll lose your temper or be tempted to, rather. Get out here on 85. Get in a Walmart jam when they got two lines open two lanes and you're in a hurry every time you go in Walmart you're in a hurry run in Walmart man I gotta get this gotta get this I have a box of pencils or pens or paper you're standing there and you can see a long way down the line and there's two of them open you're looking at 1400 lines or lanes and they're all lights are off and you're thinking what in the world boy you can lose your temper tempted to Oh, somebody did this, somebody did that. So you'll go from a temper tantrum to temperance. Lust will be turned into true love. Selfishness will change to selflessness and serving others. Greed will be replaced by giving and hating uh, and hating by helping. So you'll, you'll turn greed to giving and hating to helping if you renew your mind. Renew your mind. And then we see number three, the principle of getting your walk to match your talk is the principle of replacement. Look at verse 24 if you would. I'm almost done for tonight. Verse 24, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Look at verses 28 and 29. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather... Now notice that, that phrase, but rather. So here he just tells us, don't steal... 
Then he says, but rather. What's he saying? Replace it. Notice what he says, replace it with. So you're still, and he says, now let him labor. Working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. So instead of stealing, guess what he says to do? Replace it with work. Hey, isn't that good? The Bible says instead of going out here and, and, and when you have a renewed mind and you've removed the old flesh and the old nature and you renew your mind and all of a sudden things start changing and you're, you, you did have a temper and now you have temperance and you used to uh, curse and fight and now you love and, and, all, and now you used to steal but now you're working. Now you're working. Boy, I love the Bible. The key element of growing spiritually is learning to replace that which is bad with that which is good. A lot of times we go to camp, working with teens all these years. I still have a heart for it. I still love it. I still rather preach to teens than anybody in the world. I just do it. They're so receptive and so honest. But dealing with teens, I'd have... Brother Jacob can tell you, he grew up in our youth group. Mike and Nicole helped out some. My wife's seen it. Kids give up rock music. Give up. I remember one year, I don't know what happened. We had revival. Um, we had a girl bring two trash bags of all kinds of stuff. I don't even know what was in the trash bag. She said, Preacher, all these things are just, they're, they're weights in my life. There was magazines, there was CDs. I bet, honestly, Brother Chucky, I bet there was $2,000 worth of stuff in both those bags. Brought them and set them on the front row of the pew. I didn't know what to do with them. I was afraid to throw them away. It was so expensive. We did. We ended up burning them, didn't we? Called the parents and told them what she did, and they said, well, if that's what she wants to do. And I thought, man, it's a lot of money, but she's doing the right thing. We burned them. Didn't look back. And by the way, that girl's serving God today. Amen. Married two children. Just seen her a few weeks ago, Crystal. And she came with tears running down her face. She said, thank God for what y'all did at that camp years ago. This woman, this has been 10 years ago at least. Amazing. Amazing story. Anyway, that young lady got that. You know what she did though? She, she I said, now Chris, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to. Re and she went and replaced that bad music with good music. Amen. And they, had, they used to give me their iPods. And I would delete all the songs off their iPads and then I'd, I, I, iPods and I'd fill it with what I got on mine. Because if you don't replace it, you'll just go back to it. Amen? Just go back to it. So they got to learn. So we are to be spirit controlled people, not flesh controlled. We are challenged to live according to what we are rather than what we were. Holiness and righteousness will characterize our lives when the Holy Spirit is in control and our walk will match our talk. Another replacement principle is found in stealing and the work of our hands. I done told you that in verse 28. Uh, we see that if you need money, don't steal it, but work for it. Amen? Work for it. Then number three, Paul addresses replacement principle about the tongue. Look at verse 29. Look at this, and I'm, I'm almost done. I'm trying to hurry. Paul addresses this replacement principle about the tongue. Notice what he says. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. So, you know what that, that, uh, uh, that evil or corrupt communication... Have you ever been out near the garbage dumps around here in a very hot, blistering day and took a good whiff? That one over in Woodruff's exceptionally bad. We drive over there, man, you can smell the stench. Hot, whole humid air, stale air, no breeze. I mean, it's just stinking. You know what the Bible, that word corrupt, that's what, it's rotten. Rotten. But then he says, let, let no corrupt communication, look at verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good. So he gives that, but that which is good. So rather say that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers. So instead of being corrupt and rotten in your conversation and tearing people down and spreading hate and spreading uh, bad things, and, and by the way, not with just your tongue and your thumbs. You say, well, preacher, I ain't said nothing. <laughs> on. Right. 
But it says, but that which is good to the use of edifying. So you know what you do? Instead of the corrupt communications, what should we be doing? We should be edifying people. Ministering grace. Building people up. Listen, if somebody's missing church, and we got, we got some that are. They're, they're struggling. But instead of going and saying this, hey, yeah, 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 you, you, yeah, yeah, you ought to be, uh, uh, won't you go to them and say, you know what? I know y'all been, but can is there something I can do to help y'all and get y'all back going, uh, d- doing right? And can you maybe take them out to eat or bring them some kind of go drop by their house and just minister grace to them and say, folks, we've been praying for you, we love you. Won't you come back? Don't tear them apart. Hey, there's families that come all over and they they come through our church and they're beat all to pieces by churches and by religion and by preachers and they're torn all to shreds. And guess what we ought to do here at Bible Baptist? Minister grace. Minister Grace. Hey, help people. Edify people. Uh, well, uh, preacher, I just, I just, I struggle in that area. Hey, let's let's have a renewal in our mind. Let's renew our minds. James chapter three, verses nine and ten. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which uh, are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not so to be. So we ought to be saying, uh, listen, not not uh, wishy washy, not double tongue, but we ought to be telling people how good God is and witnessing to folks and edifying people instead of tearing people down. And by the way, uh, be consistent. Don't just go... We, we call it double-tongued or we call it, uh, we call it whatever, uh, stabbing in the back or, or, or whatever. But the, people will say something real nice to your face and when you leave, they'll tear you all to pieces. I'd rather you just be straight up with me and say something nasty to my face. And then nasty behind my back. And at least I know where you stand. Then to say something, oh, you're the best pastor in the world. I wish to God he'd go back to North Carolina. (laughs) Man, at least tell me to go. I'll know where I stand with you. I may give you a high five. Amen. Oh, what, what? I don't, hey, you say, well, preacher, no, don't tear people in front of their face and then stab them in the back and say ugly things. Folks, that hurts. Boy, it hurts people. Another area that involves replacement, and lastly, is the response to others. Look at verse 32, and I'm done. I've, I've tore this chapter all to pieces. Look, look at verse number 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And become kind. So once we were railers, once we were nasty and mean and had tempers, but now the Bible says, and be ye kind. Just be kind. I, be kind to somebody because somebody's having a tough time, right? I mean, we don't know what people's going through. and That's why a lot of times it's we shouldn't be walking around judging people saying, oh, so-and-so didn't speak to me. Well, you know, maybe so-and-so is going through a pretty tough time. It's pretty selfish for us to walk around and say, well, so-and-so didn't call me today. wonder what their problem is. You know, give people a break. Hey, just give them mercy and edify. Folks, if you are that if you've got that much time at your house to sit around and wonder who ain't called you, get a job. You're a get a job. You're a busybody. If, if all you do is wait on people's phone calls throughout the day, get a job. Amen. I ain't tell you find something to do, crochet, mow your yard, build a house, shingle your tile, do something, but don't sit around and gossip. That's right. And murmur and backbite and say, Well, I'm going to just sit on the phone all day. Hey, that is not of God. That ain't of God. That's a bunch of wicked mess right there. Do something. Get a job, clean a house, do something. Hey, preachers, there's something at the church that I can do. I, I, I'm going crazy. Hey, do it. We'll find something for you, but do not get in the ministry of tearing people down. We need people to edify, replace. Amen? Straight Bible tonight. Want to help the church. I know the last two Sunday nights have been, you come out and your face is peeled back. I understand that. I do. My wife said, you're going to be that way two nights in a row. I know. That's what the doctor ordered. 
We're going to preach on the love of God next week. Love not the world. Amen. Actually, I did that last week. Can't do that anymore. I'm done. I'm out. No, you're actually going to get salve Tuesday night. Salve and ice cream. My dad's going to come in and sugar stick y'all, and you're going to think he's the sweetest thing in the world. But I grew up with him. 